Coming up, I draw things. I play some games. I chat to Jeff. And look at some business software. Let's get on then. The Spectrum didn't have a high resolution screen, let's admit it, but when put in the hands of a great artist, the results are astonishing. Making these kind of images back in the early 80s usually meant a paint package, moving the cursor around with the keys and taking ages to come up with anything that could be remotely considered useful. You could try a light pen, but the screen flicker would probably give you a headache after 30 minutes. If you were not a large company like Ocean or US Gold, who could have better options for creating and transferring images across multiple platforms, another example of something you could use would be a graphics tablet. These though were very rare, and also very expensive. The Spectrum had one, and it was called the British Micro Graph Pad. Advertised in various magazines, boasting a comprehensive manual, uh, okay, a light pen, which isn't a light pen, and a keyboard overlay, and a plug. And you got all this for a price of £143.75 more expensive than the Spectrum itself. Adverts started to show up in the press around March 1984, showing the tablet, pen, tape and manual. It was also available for the Commodore and the BBC. The advert only showed the BBC or Commodore model though, as the ribbon cable would be much larger for a Spectrum. There were also examples of things created with it, most of which looked like they were not done on a Spectrum at all. The advert claimed the images were done by a 12 year old boy. Really? In May 1984, another advert appeared, this time showing the Spectrum version. Notice how the actual hardware differs, not only with the width of cable, but the layout of the tablet. The Spectrum version had a green strip across the top, and the others had it on the side. What this was used for will be explained later. There were also different example images, one of which, the bench line drawing, I will try and recreate later. Some adverts also had a full page of organisations that used the graph pad, including a lot of colleges. I suspect they were using the BBC version rather than the Spectrum one. The unit itself comes in a colourful box, showing the advertisement image. Mine's a bit tatty, but I'm just glad to actually have one. On the side is a sticker indicating that mine was made in July 1984. Inside there's a nice embossed polystyrene inner case, inside which is the graph pad itself. It's a large slab of lightweight plastic, with two connectors on one side, one for the ribbon cable and one for the pen. You get the cable for the Spectrum, a manual that covers the operation and setup, a tape containing the software, which indicates multiple programs, but the downloaded version only had one, maybe we'll explore this later. And finally the pen itself, with a special nib that clicks in and out. The keyboard overlay was missing. Luckily though, there was one in the manual that I scanned and printed out. Now with everything ready, I plugged it all in. You simply connect the ribbon cable, plug in the pen, and you're ready to go. Turn the machine on, load the software, and we get a nice menu. This allows you to draw or save and load various things from tape or microdrive but we're just going to draw with it. The draw screen is empty, as you'd expect, but nothing seemed to work. So I read the manual, always a good idea. I found that the first thing to do was to set the background to white, set the pen to black, and clear the screen. This is because I thought the crosshair always displayed in black, so you had a black crosshair on a black screen, which meant you couldn't see it. I later discovered that setting the ink and paper colors, then doing a screen clear, would show the cursor in the ink you chose, making it easier. The pen has a nib which pushes in as I've mentioned before, and placing it anywhere on the graph pad and pressing it down will make the crosshair appear. Now getting used to this took a while. I kept trying to make the crosshair move by picking up the pen and moving it back to where I started and moving it further across like you would a mouse. But that doesn't work on a graphics tablet. The tablet is a representation of the screen, so you just put the pen where you want it to be. The first thing I tried was to make a copy of the demo image in the advert. You select a freehand tool by pressing A, 
and then move the crosshair to the start position on the tablet and then press enter to set the point and now you can draw freehand. Lifting the pen up will stop the drawing. Using this place select and draw mechanic you can more or less make good progress. It seems this tablet has a few problems on the left hand side. Depending on the state when you power it up the pen just jumps across the first two or four character squares. But it is over 40 years old and we all get a bit wobbly once we get past that milestone. The movement is best done slowly but it does work. There's no screen flicker like a light pen and once you get used to the pad mimicking the screen it's quite easy to use although my artistic skills leave a lot to be desired. After many attempts and a few minutes I got this. To fix any problems you can zoom in and clear the ink and then redraw it. There are other drawing tools too, all selectable via the keyboard. You have things like circles, triangles, boxes and lines. You can turn on a grid, which is nice for indicating the attribute limits. You can change the paper and ink colours, which can cause problems if you're not careful. You can switch between attribute and pixel painting, again this can quickly become messy. You can add text and you can save and restore full screens from memory, tape or microdrive. You can also use fill, sort of, and again this gets very messy if you're not careful. There is a two line information box at the bottom of the screen when you start. If you move the cursor to the bottom this will flip to the top allowing you to access the full screen. There is a function called UDG which allows you to add any user definable graphics that you previously loaded from the main menu to the screen. One thought I had was could you draw something on paper, put it on top of the tablet and draw over that as though you were tracing it. I drew a face, placed it on the tablet, tried it and yes it worked. You can actually trace things through paper. But to be honest my drawing wasn't very good anyway. Now anyone that has seen or used a graphics tablet will know that the tablet itself usually has built in areas, soft buttons if you like, that do simple tasks like changing colour or brush size and this is what the green area is at the top of the tablet. But it isn't used on the spectrum, everything is done via the keyboard which is a bit of a shame really. Another point of note is that this software is attributed to John Rittman, the same person who brought us head over heels. I have no way of knowing if that's actually true. Anyway, using the graph pad, for me at least, was one of those moments I thought I would never get to experience. The cost was way outside of my budget back then, as I think it would have been for most home users. To get it now is brilliant, but what about the device itself? Does it live up to what I thought it would be? Well, no. It very nearly works, and what I mean is, it's limited by the spectrum's resolution. Any movement is on a pixel level and the spectrum has quite large pixels, so trying to keep track of them with a pen will usually create a thick line as it tries to pinpoint the exact point on the pad that the pen is touching. The pen had a habit of doing random things if you move too quickly, but I suppose the spectrum had to try and keep up with where the pen was. Again, tricky for something that's 40 years old. But overall it does work. The device was short-lived on the spectrum. Adverts stopped in December 1984, and it was still selling for £143.75, unlike many peripherals that dropped in price as time went on. For avid artists and people working in the games industry, this would have certainly helped their day-to-day -day work. For home users though, it was an expensive toy, something you got, played with for a week or so, and then pushed it into a dusty cupboard. And as for what was on the tape, well, nothing, just the same as the TZX you downloaded. It was still brilliant to actually try one out, but I wouldn't go out and spend a lot of money on one because it's simply not worth it. If ever there was a game with a story, this is it. Cat Trap was released by Streetwise in 1986, but the game started life as a competition. In June 1986, Crash Magazine launched a competition for a lucky reader to design a computer game. They teamed up with Demark and Design Design Software to bring to market a game designed by a reader and releasing it for the lucrative Christmas market. As well as getting your game written and released, you also got at least £1,000 and some interesting days out with the Crash team Demark and Design Design. So you had to design it, 
design, design, write it, and Demark publish it. I don't really know how many more times I can say the word design in this piece, but let's get on. It all sounds like a great opportunity. You also got around 10% in royalties. There was no fixed amount, it just said about 10%. Crash said they would follow the progress and keep readers updated. They also provided some handy tips for designing your own games. Things like the graphic style, the graphics type and the plot. The following two pages outlined all of the things you needed to think about to supply the programmers with, to allow yourself to be in with a chance of winning. Quite a lot of work then, even before the game moves into the development phase. In the next issue, Crash showed off some early entries, like the quest for the Clod, an arcade adventure where you control two characters with different abilities, trying to track down the location of a crashed alien spaceship in Lancaster. Quicksilver looks interesting, an isometric game involving robots, magnets and lifts. And Mr. Miser and the Bent Bean Can, another arcade adventure involving getting a refund on a dented can of beans and trying to track down a mobile shop that sold it. And finally a game aimed at the Christmas market about tracking down Christmas carols. In September, the winners were announced. Yes, there were two. The Sewer by Martin Lee was picked to be the second game to be created, but the first would be Cat Trap, designed by John Eggleton. Progress was duly made, with Crash giving updates every month. In the November issue, they did a preview, showing a couple of the levels already complete. However, despite claiming this, the levels were different from the finished game. The ruined city level is a different colour, and has far more buildings than the released one. They also showed the forest level, which is nowhere to be seen in the release, although the release version did have a level called the Charred Forest, but it looked completely different. In the December issue, they admitted the game was not going to plan, and would not therefore make it out for the festive season. They did show the cover art by Olive Ray, which looked quite nice. Eventually the game was released, and Crash gave it 84%, despite pointing out some flaws in the review. But what was it like? Well, you control MTED, a droid sent on a mission to clear post-apocalyptic Earth of Catmen, who now live there allowing Earthlings back to their home planet. To help out our little hero, a number of weapons are provided, and more can be collected on the way. Initially, there's a basic gun. Weapons collected show at the top of the screen, and you soon get a water pistol and some grenades. Different weapons are used to destroy different enemies. Not only Catmen live here, we've also got Icemen, Fire Demons and more. On level 1 you just need the gun, on level 2 you need the grenades, but level 2 is a fantastically annoying level as we'll find out. The game is a flip screen shooter, much like Exelon, but nowhere near as good. The background graphics are a bit boring really, and sound is fairly basic. A few clicks for walking and simple firing sounds. The second level is, as I've mentioned before, a nightmare. Those bouncing things either blow up, or they hit you, and send you bouncing back, sometimes several screens, which gets very frustrating. Along the way, you'll need to watch your battery power, and pick up any spare batteries you see. As the game moves on, you get different scenery and enemies. The game itself is not particularly bad, it feels like something you'd get on a budget label, and for that price you'd probably be happy for a few hours or two, but at a full price game, well, I think it's lacking, especially for 1986. The fire mechanism seems a bit hit and miss. Pressing fire initially just opens a flap on top of the character, and to fire you have to press the direction key, and if that's not bad enough, this can also sometimes trigger a long jump, meaning you fly into enemies on screens you've not even visited yet. I couldn't get very far on this game. It was just too annoying, and in places completely unfair. Watching the RZX playback, there's little variety throughout. And when you finally get to the end, there's some kind of death grid game, and then you have to get all the way back. For the person who designed it and won the competition, they would probably be happy, I suppose, but then again, they didn't actually have to pay for it, did they? I wonder what happened about the game that came second. Did it ever get created? Final set. Hey. 
Passing Shot was originally released in the arcades by Sega in 1988. Unusually for arcades, this is a tennis game and not a button mashing arcade action game. 30 Love. It's got great visuals, good music and digitized voices. So this would be hard to convert to the Spectrum. The Spectrum version was released in 1989 by Imageworks. The game does a great job of converting the arcade machine to the humble Spectrum. Most people will have played a tennis game in one form or another, and this one is certainly one of the best for the Spectrum. You start with a choice of locations and different skill levels, and then you're into the game. It starts with a view from behind the player, and as the ball flies up into the air, you have to press fire and one of the direction keys to place your serve. At this point, the view changes to overhead. You can now see your opponent running towards the ball that you've just hit, and will usually hit it straight back. At this point, you have to guess where it's going to go, move your player to intercept it, and try and hit it back to them, as is the normal game of tennis. The arcade version shows more of the chord, making it easier. The Spectrum screen is a little cut down. Once the ball's in flight, it's a mad rush to guess your position. And this has always been a tricky part of Spectrum tennis games. Many games have suffered from bad collision detection, but this one though seems to do a good job, and it's very rare that you feel frustrated. Once in position, you press the fire key again, with one of the direction keys, to return the shot. The direction keys will cause the ball to act in different ways, so you can do a slice, a lob, a topspin, or a flat shot. Usually though, you're too concerned with actually hitting the ball to worry about those sort of things, but obviously, practice will improve your gameplay. The graphics are great, as you can see, and very detailed. The players and the balls move smoothly, but the sound is a letdown. You either get music for the 1 to 8K version, or just a thwack sound when you hit the ball on the 48K version. No speech either, but then again, that's to be expected, I suppose. I would have thought that the 1 to 8K version could do much better in the sound department. The gameplay though is good, and once you get used to the controls, you can usually get some long rallies in. Tennis may not be everyone's cup of tea, but even so, most people I think would have played Match Point from Scion. But this game deserves a look. It's certainly a change from blowing up aliens. So, Paul, today what we're going to do is, instead of one of us playing a game, we're both going to play a game. We haven't done this for a long time. We haven't done it for a long time, and we're going to play Commando, because we, we went through the A's and B's, and we didn't like any of them, and Commando came up in the C's. Yeah, I'm, it's not one of my favourite games, I'm not a big fan of it. I know you like playing it in the arcade. I did, and like playing it on the Spectrum as well. It's quite hard, though. I thought you'd like it because it was a shooter. It's very hard, but yeah, okay, we'll, we'll give it a go. Are we kicking off at the same time? Yeah, after on on three, so I'll count down from three, so on one. Three, two, one, go. Right, so I've, I've hit a problem straight away in that I've set mine to use Kempston joystick and the, my fire button doesn't seem to be working properly. Doesn't it? Are you sure that's not just an excuse for... I mean, I've died twice already, and... Funnily enough, I had two practice runs before we started recording, and I uh, got really far. <laughs> I know. We, we got practice runs while I was trying to set up the audio for this. Yeah, um, and you, you you did pretty well in your practice run as well, didn't you? Right, as soon as you remember, if you stay here and you fire straight up, you'll rescue the prisoner. Yay, it works. I can't get... the Because I'm using a joystick and the game has two fire buttons, uh, i.e. Yeah. the machine gun and the, the grenade, I think with the joystick you just don't don't you just keep your finger on fire to uh, to fire the grenade. I've got through the tunnel. I don't think I've ever got through the tunnel before. I'm dead. Oh well, what's your score? 
Uh, what the highest score I got was 27,800. No, I mean now, just now. What you can't have got twenty-seven thousand just now. Eight thousand, eight thousand eight hundred. You, you'll probably beat that. But, all right, that was a really bad run. I'm having another run. I'll, oh. I'll see if I, I'll see if I can get to the second level. I, I got to the second level on both my previous practice. I've, I've runs. got I've got to some red doors. Is that the second level? Yeah, that's the doors to the second level. You've got to go past them. It's quite an intense scrap though to it get is. to get to the second I've noticed. level. I've noticed. Oh, and I've just died. Trying to pick up all the extra um, grenades. All the extra grenades. Oh. And I'm not sure that's a good tactic because I kind of, I kind of the way I've set the keys up, I can't, I can't actually use them. <laughs> I, I've put it on QA, QA OP space and M for the second grenade. I think I want to clear these two guys before I. Oh no. Yeah, that, that's where I got to. I just die. <laughs> um, oh, now I know how Rambo felt. Oh, nearly. Only had a couple I to mean, get. I, I'm not a particularly big fan of Elite Softwares. Some people may or may not know, but I think this is quite a good game, a decent conversion. This is a, decent... This is a good conversion. I yeah. mean, they also they also did, of course, Bomb Jack, which is a brilliant conversion. And they also did Airwolf, uh, which is terrible. Yeah. Oh well, but it's not a conversion, is it? Uh, well, I suppose so. so. Yeah. 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 Standing, standing in front and firing up isn't the way to do that. Are you still playing? Uh, I just stopped and watched you, but I'm, I'm back on it now. <laughs> I may change. I may change the keys because there's something weird going on. I can't fire diagonally. Well, I can, but un only under certain circumstances, which is a weird thing in itself. Is that, is, could that be something to do with the, the way... Are you using keys or...? No, I'm using uh, joystick emulation on the emulator. I don't know if you remember, but when we played before, I did have a problem with the keyboard scanning for, like, Q, W, E, or T, Y, and things like that, so... It could be an emulator thing, could it? I don't know, I might have to go to keys again, oh. I think. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, there is clearly a spot... Uh, below, after, after seeing... Staying below and oh god 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 no 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 go away go away don't 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 don't, don't. I need to kill you not you kill me um come on I'm pressing the keys and nothing's happening I think I press ah oh, I've got to the second level oh right okay good for you broken area one now rush to area two oh my. God. How did you, how did you do the second level then? Did you do the guys first? What do you mean? Did you do the guys first? Right, I've done that. <laughs> um, no, no, you've got you've got to kill all the guys to get to the second level. I know, but did you? Did oh my giddy aunt! You know what? Oh, all did, do you have to, so can't you just charge through? What do you mean you can't use? No, no, you can't just charge through. You've got to kill all of the uh, all of the enemies. And then you can get to the next level. I'm not. Oh, I can't be getting many points here. I need to be able to oh, wait. I, I got a higher score than I got last time, but still didn't get to that level. Ooh, some guy with a, some a red, a red guy. I think they shoot rockets at you or something. If, if yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> and take you straight out. Do you like the uh, initials? Input, input your initial screen. I do. You faded there. You disappeared. I said I do like it. Oh. Well, I've really enjoyed that. That's good. It's, it's not a bad game. It's a, a good pick-up and fire game. It's. I wouldn't say it was too difficult though. I mean, yes, it's difficult for me because I'm not good at Commando in any on any machine on any platform, really. Yeah, but it's not like Jetpack. I mean, Jetpack you can play for ages and loop it yeah 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 and someone got a million points on jetpack and they must have played for about 16 hours to do it <laughs> okay um this game you it's it's very hard to survive long on this game this is, is a this is i mean it's an arcade game isn't it and it's faithful to the arcade game which makes it difficult because arcade games are difficult because you want to get you to put more 10 p's in yeah i suppose so yeah but yeah, definitely enjoyed that. We'll have to do this more often. We used to do it quite quite frequently, but we stopped doing it. I think the last one we did was Daily Thompson, wasn't it? Yeah, where we had a contest and one of us was better. Was I better at day one and you better at day two, or was it the other way around? Yeah, one of that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something no, like that. Yeah.
This is Data Genie from Audiogenic Software released in 1984. Databases come in a variety of formats for every machine, including the Spectrum, and this one takes a different and unique way of displaying and entering the data. It uses Windows. It's microdrive compatible, so it can be moved to that format if needed, but it can only hold 146 records in memory at once, so not a lot compared to modern systems. The program comes in two versions, one for the 48K machine and one for the 128 machine both on the same tape. The user manual explains what a database is and takes you through the settings and the setting up and the usage of the software. The first thing you need to do is specify a field length and this is for all fields. So entering 20, for example, will set every field at 20 characters, even if it only needs five. So take your longest data item, say the first line of an address and use that as a guide. The values here though can only be between 10 and 20. Once you've done that, we get the main menu. And here we can do many things, but let's get our database set up first. Choosing Setup File, we get a confusing menu, but a little bit of reading works wonders. No fields doesn't mean no fields, it means number of fields. So selecting this will prompt you for how many fields you need. I'm going to select four, one for address, name, telephone number, and postcode. Now we can select Enter Field and add the names to these. Another confusing menu. To add names, we have to move the select bar to the empty fields underneath the edit line option, then press enter, and then type in the name. Once done, we can exit back to the main menu. We can now select enter a record to start putting data into our database. Entering data is fine, although the keyboard beep is very annoying. Let's drop in a poke to make it better. Let's say 23609,0. That should do. However, it keeps coming back to this. So I guess I'll need to dig into the basic listing, find out where it is, and turn it off. And yes, this program is mostly written in basic. By the way, the poke's at line 9000, just in case you're interested. It's tricky trying to get used to the way this works, and I keep wanting to grab a mouse, rather than using the keys. It's like going back to the old DOS days, when everything was keyboard driven. Anyway, we've now got a few records added and we can view them. Here you can move up and down or edit up and down. So you can edit from this menu as well. Back onto the main menu and we can see other things like where the data will be stored. We can print and also change the character set. Once you've got used to using the program and the menus, it becomes quite easy and quite quick to enter data. There's also a handy CLS option in case the screen gets too full of old menus. A novel idea and a different way to handle setting up and storing data. The program even has a search option, although what you type in has to be exactly what you're searching for, including case sensitivity. Not a bad database program at all then, and one to consider should you be looking for such a thing. This is The Unicorn, released in 2023 as part of the Yandex Games competition. This is a superb puzzle game with nice graphics and incidental music. You control a unicorn that has to go on various tasks and the story unfolds as you progress. Being a puzzle game means there's no running about, shooting or jumping. This is a kind of chess-based thinking game where you can only move like a knight does. In other words, and I'm not a chess player, so I may be wrong about this, but in an L shape. Making it easy, the final positions are shown as you move the cursor around, so you can only choose a certain route. As the game progresses, things get tougher, and other elements come into play. Other characters start to move towards you, meaning you have to work out what their limitations are before making your move. A great little game then, that certainly gets the old brain matter going, and definitely worth playing. <laughs> 